This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can find all the cards featured in this video in their store if you follow the links in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone and it's Wednesday so that means it's time for another MTG Top 10. Normally, this series ranks the best cards in the game using empirical data from the history of competitive magic. But this is the last MTG Top 10 of 2020, and at the end of the year, I like to give my picks for my favorite cards of that year. This list is entirely based on my own opinion, and it isn't a list of the best cards of 2020. Instead, it's just cards that I really liked for a variety of different reasons. Some of them are here because I think it's a cool design, others are here because I like the art, and still others are here because I enjoyed playing with the card. Oftentimes, as we'll see, they get here thanks to a combination of those things. Keep in mind, by the way, that I pretty much only play Magic on Magic Arena, and I really only play Limited, so that is the context I'll be talking about for many of these cards. To be eligible for this list, a card had to receive its first printing in 2020, and the four new standard release sets of 2020 were Theros Beyond Death, Corset 2021, Ikoria Lair of Behemoths, and Zendikar Rising, and all of the cards in those sets can be on this list. All right, let's get to this top 10. At number 10, I have Fearless Fledgling. This card is really good in Zendikar Rising Limited, and I've played with it a lot. It can take over games despite only being a two drop, but the factor that really helps the Fledgling make this list for me is the art. Griffins are usually very majestic and intimidating looking creatures. Apparently though, that isn't how their lives begin. Fearless Fledgling is so ridiculous and awkward looking that it somehow comes out as so ugly, it's cute. One of my non-magic hobbies is bird watching, and Fearless Fledgling reminds me of what we see with real world birds, raptors in particular, since when fully grown they are majestic and intimidating creatures, but baby raptors are similarly ridiculous looking. At number 9, it is Utropia, the twice favored. I think Theros Beyond Death was a pretty good limited format, and it was pretty fun to play with a bunch of enchantments, especially when there were crazy good enchantment payoffs like Utropia. Despite only being an uncommon, Utropia could completely take over games, and one of the great things about her was that, even after she died, the plus one plus one counters stuck around, so she tended to have at least some impact on the game no matter what, and that kind of value is something I really like. Signpost and commons go a long way towards making an archetype or limited format fun, and Utropia definitely delivered there. At number 8, it is Thundering Spark Mage. I think the party mechanic in Zendikar Rising is a lot of fun and limited. It's something that is new and refreshing. Normally, we just care about one creature type in a deck, but having to have a nice mix of creature types to maximize certain cards is a lot of fun, and I think overall, Thundering Spark Mage is the party card that I most enjoy. It isn't anything fancy, but if you do a good job in the draft, the Spark Mage basically becomes Flame Tongue Kavu or Necrotal. It just kills something when it comes down, and that type of creature is always excellent. At number 7, I have Iridescent Horn Beetle. The Black Green archetype in Zendikar Rising is all about plus one plus one counters, and the Horn Beetle is an amazing payoff for that type of deck. The fact it gives you an insect token for every single counter that comes into play during a turn is amazing, and it allows the Horn Beetle to very quickly overwhelm opposing boards. Those extra tokens pile up in a hurry, and the Beetle can even help you stabilize from behind if you literally play your cards right. Despite all that power, I actually think it is a fair design too. I mean, it has pretty inefficient stats, and it has to survive until the end of your turn to give you the insects. I think they did a good job designing a balanced card that is still powerful and a lot of fun with Iridescent Horn Beetle. I've enjoyed this card a lot in Zendikar Rising Limited. At number 6, I have C Dasher Octopus. So, I think that overall, Ikoria Lair of Behemoths was easily the worst limited format of the year, and maybe the worst one in the last few years. The cycling deck was utterly broken, companions were busted before they eroded them, and it was too easy to just play all the colors and cast ultimatums. The format was very, very unbalanced, and it made it hard to have a great time drafting it a ton. With that in mind, I think Mutate was actually the best new mechanic of the year, even beating out Party for me. It was admittedly confusing, and it has some unintuitive aspects, like the fact that if what you target with the Mutate creature dies, the creature just comes into play normally. But once you got used to it, Mutate was very fun and flavorful too, and it allowed for some interesting decisions in games. Combining creatures together allowed for a whole lot of interesting combos, 
Sea Dasher Octopus is one of my favorite mutate creatures. After all, I love drawing cards, and this comes with Flash. So if you can mutate it onto something that's unblocked at instant speed and suddenly draw a card, you're going to be in good shape. After all, it helps to offset the potential card disadvantage associated with mutate. It also doesn't hurt that the Octopus Teacher came out on Netflix this year, giving me new affection for Octopi. At number 5, I have Back for More. We've seen reanimation spells and fight spells before, but combining both into one instant speed spell is really cool. A card like this requires significant setup, like, you know, you need something sizable in your graveyard, but the payoff can be crazy. You can reanimate a big creature at instant speed, use it to block one thing, and then fight something else. That can be a 3 for 1, and that isn't something that was uncommon to see in a Coria Limited. This was a great signpost uncommon for Black Green. The one downside about Back for More is that it was in a Coria, a set with a multitude of problems, which I've already discussed. The card does a great job of doing something very black, reanimation, and doing something very green, fighting. It's a powerful and interesting design, and that makes it one of my favorite cards of the year. At number four, I have Satessan Champion, the second constellation creature to make the list. I have always loved Enchantress creatures. In the past, I've played Enchantress decks in a variety of different constructed formats, so anytime they print a new one, I'm pretty excited. FYI, if you don't know what I mean by Enchantress, I mean a creature that draws you a card when you play an enchantment, like Argothian Enchantress and several other Enchantresses from the game's past. Drawing a card every time you play an enchantment is a great payoff, and Satessan Champion also gets bigger every time you do. That made the champion a 3-mana bomb in most games, because decks that ran it could generally trigger it with most of the non-lands they had in the deck, and that card advantage would eventually snowball to the point that the player who controlled the champion was unbeatable. That said, Satessan Champion did begin life in a very vulnerable way, and I think that helped balance this card. At number 3, I have another mutate creature, Dreamtail Heron. The Heron draws you a card when it mutates, which is already something I'm going to be interested in. And one of my favorite combos in Ikoria involved two blue commons, turn 3, Thieving Otter, and turn 4, Dreamtail Heron. If you could pull that off, it would be very difficult for opposing players to find a way to win the game against you. You know, unless they drafted the Bonkers Cycling deck, or had a companion, or could cast ultimatums. Dreamtail Heron also gets some extra points because I see the similar looking great blue herons on a regular basis here in the real world, and I think the art on this card does a great job of depicting real world herons. At number two, I have Waker of Waves. I would have really liked this card in any format. I love that early on it gives you what basically amounts to strictly better cycling, and in the late game, it gives you a fairly efficient body that also messes up your opponent's creatures. But what really sealed the deal to make Waker of Waves one of my favorite cards of the year is that Corset 2021 had a legitimate reanimator archetype. That meant you could cycle away the Waker early and then reanimate it on turn 4 or 5. At that point, it utterly changed the game and had to be killed, and if it wasn't, the whale normally just took over from there. And at number 1, I have Roost of Drakes. There are several different value engines on this list, and those tend to be things I really enjoy playing with, especially in Limited. Managing to build around something is a great feeling, and Roost of Drakes is a great example of that. Getting a 2-2 Drake every single time you kick a spell makes it so that all of your kicker spells become insanely efficient. I also really like that you can just play the Roost in just about any blue deck in the format, since at worst, it's a 4-mana 2-2 flyer with kicker upside, and most decks will have kicker, even if they didn't get a critical mass of it going. Obviously, when you have 10-plus cards with kicker is when you really live the dream. The Roost can be somewhat oppressive, it should be noted. It really lets kicker decks stabilize, even if they're way behind on turn 4 or 5. But I think they did something pretty smart to help keep the Roost in check to some degree, and that is that most colors have a common that can destroy it. Even black can destroy it with Feed the Swarm at common. And while that card has some weird flavor things going on, the fact it can blow up Roost of Drakes with ease goes a long way towards keeping the Roost from being so oppressive. Well, those are my favorite cards of 2020. If you want to buy any of these cards, you can find a direct link to each of them in the Card Kingdom store in the description. What were your favorite cards of 2020? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future MTG Top 10s, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you need to catch up on the MTG Top 10s I've already done, you should see the playlist on your screen now. Thanks for watching, and Happy New Year.